In this video, we're going to apply Burnside's counting theorem to solve some combinatorial problems using group actions. Now, before we do that, it's important to never underestimate a theorem which counts something. Combinatorics is a very powerful discipline in mathematics. Counting things can be very, very useful. So we should always, always pay attention to things that count things like Burnside's theorem, the fundamental counting theorem uh, when it comes to these group actions. Uh, Burnside's theorem is a very important combinatorial tool, especially in the scenarios that we're going to do in this video, uh, because it can often be difficult to count the orbits of a generic group action. Now, before we get to our combinatorial example, let me present one more example of a group action. That is, I want to present a way of constructing a new group action from an old group action, because these are the type of things we're going to count in these combinatorial problems. So imagine we have a group G that acts upon a set X. It's just some generic group action. I don't care what it is. It's just we have a group action. Then if you take any other set Y, it might have nothing to do with X. I don't care. But if you take any set Y, you can form the set of functions, which is commonly denoted as Y to the X. So Y to the X will be the set of all functions of the form F takes as its domain X and as its co-domain Y. So y to the x is this set of functions. The set of functions y to the x is itself a g set in a natural way. The set of functions inherits the g set structure from x. And you do it in the following way. Well, since y to the x is a collection of functions and g is a group, we have to make sense on what does it mean for a group element to act upon a function. It should produce a new function. So what is the function g dot f? So the image of the function f when it's acted upon by g. It should be a function that takes as its domain x and then lands in y. But remember the domain of the function f is a g set. So it makes sense to act on x by the element g. And that's exactly what we do. So to define the function, I'm going to tell you what the rule is because a function is a rule that assigns everything to its domain, something in the codomain. So the function given by the rule g dot f will be, if you take an arbitrary element of the domain x, g dot f of x will then be f of g dot x. So in some regard, you're sticking the g inside of that. So you, So the function that's acted upon by f will be that function which then always acts upon its input by that element g. This is a lot easier to do if you have a left action. If you have a right action, you can do the same thing, but you have to do it on the right and it's gotta be like a, an inverse that's common when you use right actions. We always do left actions, of course, in this video. So we can construct an action on functions by just pushing the action onto the input. That's exactly the type of action we're gonna see in just a second. So now let's get to applications of Burnside's theorem. How can we use Burnside's theorem to help us count combinatorial objects? Well, imagine for the moment a square, uh, such a square is visualized right here. Imagine we have the task where we want to color the vertices of a square. So like we wanna color this one, we wanna color this one, we wanna color this vertex, and maybe we wanna color this vertex. Where repetition could be allowed, we could allow to color this, a different vertex the same color. So on the screen a moment ago with my circles, I did yellow, yellow, green, and blue. That would be a coloring of this square. So imagine we're considering how many different ways we could color a square. Now for simplicity's sake, let's just focus on two colors. Because if you only have one color, there's only one way to do it. You color all the corners the same color. All right, we don't worry about that. But let's say we want to label, or we want to place two colors on our square. And we'll just make it simple and we'll say black and white. How many ways can we do it? Well, if you have your square, basically you take the first one, there's two options. You could do black or white. Then you take the next one, you could do black or white. You could do the next one, black or white. Two options there, two options there. So in essence, you have two options, two options, two options, two options. So the counting principle in play here is if, if these decisions are made independent of each other, which they are, the color in one vertex doesn't affect the other, you're going to get 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is equal to 16. There are 16 ways to color uh, that square. But that's not exactly true, is it? I mean, if the, if the square is sort of stuck 
to the ground, you can't move it, then sure, there's going to be 16 ways to color it. But what if the square is allowed to move? What if it can move freely in the plane or move freely in, in the space? You could rotate it and flip it, kind of like the dihedral group does to a square. What about that situation? Well, I want you to look at these four squares for a moment. Um, here's a square which has a black corner and then three white corners. Here's one where this, of course, is going to be in the northwest corner is black. But what if the northeast corner is black, all the others are white? Or what about the southeast is black, all the others are white? Or what about the southwest corner is black and everything else is white? These would be considered four different colorings by the strategy we were employing a moment ago. But do we really want to consider these different colorings? Like imagine this is some toy that a kid plays with. You start spinning around your square. If you started off by coloring the northwestern corner black, then when you spin it around, it's really the same square. Because once you pull that square out of the box, each and every one of those squares is a possible orientation. So the problem we had earlier is when we started coloring and we got two times two times two times two, is we believed we could tell the corners apart. Like there was some labeling, we thought they were distinguishable. So like, oh, the first vertex could be black or white, the second vertex could be black or white, the third and the fourth could be black or white. But what happens when we can't tell the vertices apart? Well, when you start rotating the square, when you start flipping the square, you can't tell apart who was, who was the original vertex one because it got moved around. So because of these equivalent orientations, it becomes a lot harder to count the number of square colorings we can have. So this is why Burnside's theorem comes into play. Because as I'm talking about moving the square, this is a D4 action on the square. The D4, the dihedral group there, it rotates the square, it reflects the square. And so if you give a coloring to the square, any rotation of that coloring would be an equivalent coloring. Any reflection of that coloring would be an equivalent coloring. So as D4 acts on the square with its colors, that creates equivalent colorings and we don't want to count those colorings as different ones. So our 16 number has actually overcounted the numbers because two different colorings are really the same, but we counted them as if they're different. Now, D4 does act on the square, but the G set that we're looking for is not going to be the square. It's going to be colorings of the square. So imagine we have our set Y right here um, for which Y is the square. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four as the square right there. So the vertices of the square. We're not trying to count, we're not trying to count uh, the orientations of the square. We're trying to count the colorings. A coloring of the square is a function from the set 1, 2, 3, 4 to the set BW, where we can think of B is black and W is white. So as we think of this function, we have some function here F, where you have Y over here and then black and white over here. We have to make a choice on these vertices. It's like, oh, the first vertex is black, the second one is white, the second one is white, the fourth one is black. Every function is a coloring, it's an assignment of the vertices to a color. So the colorings are what we're trying to look at, the equivalent colorings. So the set that we actually care about is the set of functions from the set one, two, three, four to the colors black and white. So we're looking at this function set right here. What are the possible colorings? But when you think of your function, you have two options for this first, two options for the second, two options for the third, two options for the fourth. So this number 16 that we got earlier is significant, but we were counting the wrong thing. 16 is counting the number of colorings of the square, but we're trying to count the number of equivalent colorings. So two different equivalent colorings are considered the same. And so we're counting the orbits of the coloring under the, orient the rotations and reflections of the square. So Burnside's theorem is relevant here with D4 acting on the set X because it's a function set. It's a function um, set on a G set, on a D4 set. So we can do that. So let's look at the stabilizers for a moment. I should say the stable sets. Who is stabilized by the identity? That's an easy one. 
every function, every coloring with its orientation is fixed, and therefore you're going to get 16. The stable set of the identity is always the entire thing, so we get 16 right there. So let's think about rotations for a moment. Who gets fixed by a rotation? So if you have a square over here and you rotate it, well, if this color was white, when you rotate it, then this color has to be white, okay? Um, and so this one will move over and become this one over here. But this has to be the same thing we started with. So if this one was white, when we rotate it, it will move down here, and that would then be white. So this one has to be white. Similarly, if this one was white, because it starts and stops at the same spot, that the square, this one move over here and be white, and this one also be over here coming white. So basically, when you rotate the square, the only way you can have the same square when you're done is if all of the colors are the same. So they're all white or they're all black. I did the example with white, uh, but we can do it all with all black. So there's two options. There's the all white square and there's the all, the all black square. By similar reasoning, if you rotate three times, that's the same thing. That's the same thing as rotating counterclockwise once. And the only thing that will be left stable by that action would be the all black or the all white square. So you only get two, two options right there. Okay, what about R2 if we rotate twice? That one gives a little bit more flexibility here because if this one was white and we rotate it twice, then that means this one's going to have to be white. But then when you rotate it back, that's going to be white again. So these two colors, these two corners have to be the same color, okay? But this one right here, it could potentially be a different color because when you rotate and come over here, this one's going to have to agree with it. But then this will rotate back and it'll have to agree with it as well. So these ones on a different diagonal actually could disagree with each other. They don't have to be the same color. So basically what I'm saying here is when you rotate this thing, uh, the corners that are opposite of each other, they will have to be the same color. There's two options there. But then these ones, they will have to be the same color too. And it could be the same color as this one, but it doesn't have to be. So you get two options for this color and two options for this color. So that gives you two squared options, which then turns out to be four. So that'll take care of the rotations. What about reflections now? Well, if we think of reflections here, let's do S. S is the horizontal reflection, so we reflect like that. Well, with the horizontal reflection, whatever this color on this corner has to be, it has to be this color too, because those two are just going to swap each other. But then this one, it could be a different color. It'll come down here and agree with this color. So those colors have to agree with each other for this uh, permutation. So in other words, we're saying that this side of the square has to have the same color, which there's two options there, and this side of the square it's gonna to have to have the same color too, which it could be a different color, but you'll have two options there. That gives you two squared, which is equal to four. All right, um, jumping down to R squared S, we get a very similar picture there because in this situation, you have now a horizontal line. And by similar reasoning, these two vertices will have to be the same color, which gives you two options. And these two vertices will have to be the same color which gives us two options because we're looking for what is a square that's not a, that's not changed when you do these rotations, uh, excuse, these reflections in this situation. So like if these are black and these are white, when you reflect it, you won't be able to tell the difference on the coloring. It doesn't give you a different coloring. So those are stable. Those are stabilized by R squared S. So again, you're going to get two squared, which is equal to four. You'll notice I skipped R S. Uh, because that is a reflection, but it's a diagonal reflection that actually has a different effect on things. Because notice that when you t look at this element right here, this corner, whatever its coloring is, let's say it's black, when you reflect it over, if this is the same coloring, this would have to also be black, okay? Basically, everyone who's in the same orbit of the D4 action on the square has to have the same color. But what about this one right here? This one could be white, um, because these two colors doesn't affect it, but this one could also be white or black. It doesn't matter what the other colorings are. These, if we look at the orbits of the vertices by the D4 action, these two color, these two vertices have to have the same color. There's two options there, but this one, because it's left fixed by the reflection, it could be its own color. You get two options. 
But also this corner down here could also be a different color. It doesn't have to coincide with the other vertices. So you actually get two times two times two options, which is equal to eight. And so then if we do this whole exercise one more time with our cube desk, that's the diagonal, uh, that's the reflection across this diagonal, I should say. Same thing, this could be any color, this could be any color, and let me use a different color to emphasize, it doesn't have to be the same color. Uh, but then these ones, they do have to be the same. So you get two, 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 two times two times two is eight, and that then gives you the size of that right there. All right, so let me bring up my notes here. So then what we then see is we counted up all these stable sets. We then get that by Burnside's theorem, the number of orbits will equal one over the group, the group's order. This is the dihedral group, it's order eight. And then you add up all of these stable set sizes. So we get 16 plus two plus four plus two plus four plus eight plus four plus eight, for which while some of these numbers don't look like they're divisible by eight, notice if you take two plus four plus two, that's an eight. 4 plus 4 is 8. You actually get 16 plus 8 plus 8 plus 8 plus 8. All of these are actually divisible by 8, which of course has to be the case. K is an integer, but yet you're dividing it by an integer. That means this has to add up to be something that's divisible by 8. It'll happen eventually. So 16 plus 8 plus 8 plus 8 plus 8 is divisible by 8. You get 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, which adds up to be 6. This tells us by Burnside's theorem, there are six colorings of the square. And I can give them to you real quick. There's the all white coloring. There's the all black coloring. We talked about those. We also saw the example where one of the corners is black and the other corners are white. While there are ways you could rotate that one, those aren't considered different squares. There's also it's dual where you have a white corner and three black corners. But then what about the other two? There should be two more. Well, these other ones are gonna be when you have two blacks and two whites. So what if like both the tops are black and both of the bottoms are white? That's, that's one. And then the very last one is what if the colors are kitty corner of each other? What if the blacks are diagonal from each other and the whites are diagonal from each other? So up to equivalence, these six squares are the only squares that you can get by coloring right? Every other square will be equivalent to them up to rotation and reflections, which is what we're trying to consider here. Before we do another example, I want to point out a very important observation here. Looking at the sizes of all these stable sets, what's in common with all of them? We end up with 16, 2, 4, 2, 4, 8, 4, 8. These are all powers of 2. And notice where they came from, right? 16 was 2 to the 4th. Um, four was two squared, eight was two cubed. We also had a two, which of course is just two to the first. Um, they're all powers of two. Is that a coincidence? The answer of course is no. Each of them has a form, each of the stable sets had the form two to the A. And where did, where do these numbers come from? Where does the base come from? Where does the power come from? The base, the base is easy to explain here. The base is the number of colors because whenever there was a decision that had to be made, that decision was either black or white. Every decision had two options you could appeal to. And then the letter A, it represented how many choices had to be made. That depended on the orbit structure that was going on with our square. And that comes directly from the dihedral action on the square. If we wrote our elements of the dihedral group as permutations on the set one, two, three, four, it would look something like this. The identity fixes everything. Um, one, two, three, four is what R is. R squared is one, three, and two, four. And then we can keep on going with each of every one of these. We could think of the dihedral group as a permutation group acting on the set one, two, three, four. Now I want you to look at the orbit structures here. The identity has four different cycles in its decomposition. If we typically skip one cycles because they just leave the elements fixed, but for the sake of counting, I wanna include all of the one cycles. So the identity has four one cycles. Remember what the size of X1 was? It was two to the fourth, four being the number of orbits, the number of cycles in this decomposition here. Um, then what about R? If you remember from the previous slide, R, when we looked at XR, it had just two, which is two to the first. Your base two, because you had two colors, two options, but then the exponent was one because you had one cycle in the permutation action there. 
What about the other ones? Well, for x r squared, we had uh, 2 squared. 2 came from the two colors, that's the base, and then the exponent, there's two cycles in the decomposition. So that's how all of these are going to work. So the how many for this one? You had 2 to the first, one cycle. For this one, you had 2 squared, two cycles. This one, rs, you actually had 2 cubed. Where do you get that? You get 1, 2, 3 cycles in the permutation representation, and therefore you get 2 to the third. The number of cycles tells you the number of the number of options you had and you had two options for each so that's where the two to the two cubed came from so with this perspective about the permutation cycles and the number of colors this idea of coloring up to equivalence becomes a whole lot easier let's look at another example of this um, i want to redo this exact same example that we did a moment ago but this time let's color the squares vertices with four different colors if i have four different colors how many possible ways could we color the square up to equivalence? Well, we're trying to compute K. What are the number of orbits of this group action up to equivalence, right? That's what, that's what orbits are measuring here. Well, the group is still the dihedral group. It still has order, order eight. So you have this one eighth in front. So then look at the stable set. Let's see if I can get this to fit on the same screen. Voila, we have all of the permutation decompositions of the dihedral group right here. So the first one, you have now four colors, but you still have four cycles. So you get four to the four, that's gonna be 256. For the next one, you have four colors, one cycle, in which case you're gonna get four to the first. Um, R squared has two cycles, so you get four squared. R cubed has one cycle, so you get four to the first. Um, S has two cycles, so you get four squared. RS has three cycles, so you get four cubed, which is 64. You get R four squared for R squared S has two cycles, and then R cubed S also has three cycles, so you get four cubed right there. So when you, with that perspective, it's like, voila, I can pull this thing out really, really quickly because I know the cycle structures for this permutation action. We have to take one eighth of 256 plus 8 plus 16 plus 16 plus 64 plus 16 plus 64. That simplifies just to be 55. So while the two-colored example, I probably could have done it by hand, this one's going to be a lot harder because there are 55 distinct colorings. Um, and that's not even considering that some colorings are equivalent. These are 55 distinct colorings up to equivalence. Burnside's theorem is a very effective counting technique when we have to count functions of a permutation action. So to finish this lecture, let me give you one more example. We're gonna switch things up a little bit. This time we're gonna ask ourselves, how many ways can we label a four-sided die? So like if you're really into Dungeons and Dragons and other role-playing games, six-sided die are not enough for you. You want your dice to have four sides and eight sides and 20 sides, you know, you take all the platonic solids there. So if we think of like a tetrahedron, right? Something like this. So let's color the vertices of the tetrahedron. So you have like, there's one, two, three, four vertices. So what if we want to, we're not coloring this one, I'm sorry. We're just gonna label this one. So we could label it like that. Could I label it something different? Like, could I label like, we'll do this one, one, this one, two, this one, three, this one, four. But if it's a four-sided die, the idea is you're gonna be rolling this. You're gonna be casting this die. As you spin it around, it's gonna move around. It's still the same die, even though if we change our orientation, what labels actually give us a different labeling of this thing? That's an interesting question, but group theory provides a very slick way of counting the ways we can label the four vertices of a tetrahedron, of a four-sided die here. And the important observation is to remember the symmetry group of the tetrahedron. If we look at just rotational symmetries, because as we, as we refer, uh, as we roll our four-sided die, we can't reflect it through space. We're just rolling it. That's rotational symmetry. The rotational symmetry group of the tetrahedron was A4. This is something we talked about in the first semester of abstract algebra, which, of course, with A4, remember, you have the identity. You're going to have three 2-2 two, two cycles. So you have the, uh, have we listed these things. You have the identity. You're going to have the two cycles, 2-2 two, two cycles, 1-2-3-4. Two, you have 1-3-2-4. And we have 1-4-2-3. Um, we're also going to have eight three cycles. So we have like 1-2-3 and we have 1-3-2. Uh, okay. We're going to have 1-3-4 and we're going to have 1-4-3. Uh, let's see, is there another one? We have one, two, four, 
and we have one, four, two. And then lastly, we're gonna have two, three, four, and we're gonna have two, four, three. So these are these are our eight three cycles. Okay. Now the the three cycles actually show up in two different consciousy classes, and I don't claim I don't claim that I have any orientation with those consciousy classes are right now, but it turns out if you know the conjugates, you can actually simplify these things a lot more because conjugates in a permutation group will have to have the same cycle structure. But nonetheless, it's really just the cycle structure we know. So we have one element, which really that one element is going to look like one, two, three, four. Okay, we're going to have these two, two cycles, which have two cycles each, as the name suggests. And then for the three cycles, well, there are three cycles, but there's a fixed element. So we should, really should think of it as like one, two, three, and then four as a separate thing. So they have two orbits each, each of the three cycles. But what's left fixed, right? How many things are left fixed going on with this, um, with this right here? So with the tetrahedron, the identity leaves everything fixed. So you get the whole thing. You get all possible labels here, which you're going to get four factorial of this. This is a little bit different than um, the colorings we did before because we can't repeat colors anymore. Um, a label this time is a permutation. Uh, we have to label this one one, this one two, this one three, this one four. So there's four factorial ways you could color or you could label the die, Okay. Now let's ask ourselves, what's left fixed by a 2-2 two -two cycle? Um, so if you have a 2-2 two -two cycle, like if you take 1, 2, 3, 4, you're going to swap those things around. You're going to swap those things around. The issue here is that with a 2-2 with a two -two cycle, everything gets moved around, but we can distinguish the vertices because they're labeled. This isn't like the coloring did before. When you do a 2-2 two -two cycle, nothing is left fixed. Everything got moved around. Okay, so nothing's left fixed. So we get that gives us a different labeling. So it turns out if you take your three two two cycles, each of their stable sets are empty. It has size zero. So that's actually just going to be ignored in the sum. The same thing is also going to happen with the three cycles. Okay, there's eight of them, but each of their stable sets is empty. If we look at the stable set of one, two, three, this is actually the empty set. There is no tetrahedron labeled where if we swap one two and three it would be the same labeling because one two and three moved you would have to swap it's not like the colors we did earlier where you swapped a black with a black no you're swapping a one with a two that's noticeable and as such these labels are you, you see them move the stable set's going to be empty here as well so by burnside's theorem the number of colorings uh, I should say the number of labelings here, it's going to be 1 over the order of the group, which is 12. That's A4. Um, you have 4 factorial plus 0 plus 0. So you get 4 factorial, which is 24 over 12. That just gives you 2. So it turns out there are only 2 labelings of a 4-sided die. Um, one of them's on the screen right now. Can you come up with the other one that is different, that's actually not equivalent to the one on the board? right now it's an interesting question um i actually would challenge you also to do the same question with a six-sided die how many ways can you label a six-sided die so that when you roll them they're actually different labels um you have you i'll give you of course the hint there are six sides to the six-sided die obviously you have to label one through six but what's the symmetry group there we proved previously that the symmetry group was it's isomorphic to s4 use that to try to identify what are the number of labels you can put on a six-sided die? Thanks for watching this video and this lecture, everyone. I hope you learned something. Give us a like if you did. If you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to the channel. And as always, if you have any questions or comments or answers to questions I gave to you in the video, uh, put those comments below and I'll answer them at my soonest convenience.